When I was a kid, I wasn't allowed to watch Sex in the City, cruelly trapped behind the horrors of a conveniently early bedtime, and so, as forbidden media, it inevitably fascinated me. Later, when I was able to watch it in full as an adult in a shiny, free world, I thought it was okay. It was in some moments surprising, relatable, embarrassing, and very explicit, but it stank more of aspirational consumerism than anything else, which bored me because they were buying ugly heels instead of, I don't know, hit games for the PS2. Like, if Carrie bought an eye toy into her fancy apartment, I would have been like, oh, okay, girl. But the outfits and stuff were just not particularly to my taste. I was more of a tweed blazer enthusiast. I watched Annie Hall once and kind of something happened within me, but that's, that's, that's not relevant. Don't worry about that. So as refreshing as it must have been at the time for women to have a TV series as frank and as focused on a successful group of female friends speaking openly about their sexual problems with cocktails. Women walk around thinking we. And their version of we is me and my dick. Totally. And the show, to an impeccable modern woman like me, felt like less of a truly meaningful exploration of the female experience than it seemed to really want to be. Nevertheless, I loved Miranda's sneering sarcasm, Samantha's camp baldness, Charlotte's eternal sweetness, and Carrie's gentle nodding and smiling whenever the aforementioned women say and do stuff. Mmm. Sex in the City was a show, for better or worse, that encapsulated the era and quickly ended the canon of iconic television. No sooner had Rick 9 Plus entered the chat room than he got a message from his favorite on-screen pal, Big Tool for You. Four years after it ended, in the glorious year of 2008, they made a Sex in the City movie. But by now, it had become a bit dull. The woman had their husbands, almost. <laughs> And the vibes had deflated. We're gonna gloss over that one though, because it's 2010 follow-up Sex in the City 2 is really weird. And it's weird in a way that makes me personally insane. Let me reveal to you its esteemed tale. <laughs> the movie is about the four women taking a trip to Abu Dhabi, but it starts here, at a gay wedding. Okay, it's a gay wedding. One of the biggest tragedies of this movie is that the first 20 minutes are really quite fun. It lures you into a false sense of security. You think, damn, okay, Sex in the City 2 is good maybe? It opens with Carrie reminiscing about the first time she met her friends. Miranda's 80s fit here is transcendent. She, <laughs> she looks good. Then we get to listen to a song about how this is Sex in the City. There were four friends in New York they met and they always stick together in the city of sex. <laughs> so true. That, that is what I'm watching, for real. Uh, this song immediately delights me. This is good stuff. This is what this is what music is for. This is what music is all about. Then we attend the wedding of Antony and Stanford, and it is so well designed and beautiful. They have swans. They have an unbelievable choir. If ever I would be you, it wouldn't be in summer. And then guess what? Liza drop. Liza's here. Thank you. Liza Minnelli. She performs Beyonce's single ladies, and in this moment, I'm in bliss. I'm thinking, okay, this movie rocks. All the single ladies, all the single ladies. Unfortunately, this is the movie's peak. It has slayed too soon. We must now begin our descent into hell. Charlotte, the gentle, most uptight member of the group, after a few minutes of the movie spraying the words gay wedding at us like a zookeeper hosing down the hogs. Gay wedding? Gay wedding. Gay wedding. Gay wedding. Gay wedding. Gay Will you please stop referring to this as a gay wedding? Tells her friends, guys, we actually need to be more woke, I think. You guys aren't quite woke enough for me right now. It's a gay wedding. I figured what's one more little bitch with an attitude? You guys, <laughs> shouldn't we be a little bit more PC? Antony, her friend and one half of a gay wedding that is now about to happen, says this. Can you believe this place? It looks like the Snow Queen exploded. An extremely not non-PC comment, like a completely uncontroversial and non-edgy comment. And Big hears that and is like, damn. <laughs> How's that for PC? <laughs> True. <laughs> this guy, this guy's so edgy. <laughs> Take that, Charlotte. Do not try to be more woke around me. My name is Big. This is the thing about Sex in the City. It presents a light edginess wherever it can, and I guess in this case, where it can't. The conspiratorial mockery of Charlotte 
as a concept is maybe the point. Everyone here is like, oh, Charlotte, you policeman, you. But you know, she didn't do anything worthy of rebelling against here. And, and indeed, no one rebelled. It's, it's extremely limp. Why is it here? I don't know. This little sideways wink at something edgy is tragic in contrast with the original show, too. Watching its first episode now is still so arresting and so direct, it, it still feels different and weird and powerful. There's not one woman in New York who hasn't turned down ten wonderful guys because they were too short or too fat or too poor. I have been out with some of those guys, the short, fat, poor ones. It makes absolutely no difference. They are just as self-centered and unappreciative as the good-looking ones. Why don't these women just marry a fat guy? Why don't they just marry a big fat tub of lard? You know, we're looking Carrie in the eyes. Something was going on here, something that very much included a jazz soundtrack. But by 2008, the vibes are no longer caustic, they're just sad. Moments later, Carrie gives her friends a lecture after they discover that Antony is allowed to cheat. Dan forgets the wedding of his dreams and I get to cheat. Whatever that means. Carrie chides them for being a bit confused and uncomfortable with this comment because Carrie, as it turns out, is our true woke spokeswoman when it comes to cheating. It's not really any of our business. She loves to do it. She loves to support it. Anyway, obviously if they actually have an understanding, it's hardly cheating, but the movie leaves us pretty unclear on what the situation actually is. FYI, Anthony's out there telling people he's allowed to cheat. I know. He hates the tradition, so he pushes against it. So he is allowed to cheat? Yes, but only in the 45 states where we're not legally married. Okay, ha 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 ha. But for real, bro, what is the nature of your sexual relationship? Please tell all your friends now. I don't know what's going on, and it frightens me. Carrie notices that she's listed by her married name at this wedding and acts a bit weird about it. Carrie Preston. What? Nothing, I'm just... Surprised not to be Bradshaw at your wedding. Carrie can shrug this off for now because Liza's here though, so we move sideways to begin Miranda's plot thread, which is that she be on that phone. Hey, I'm kissing here. I I have to, it's from him. At 19 minutes in, we have the first sex of the Sex in the City 2 movie. Congratulations. And Samantha's plot line is, as you will already know if you have any familiarity with the show, uh, that she is interested in having sex. It's bold, it's groundbreaking, it's crazy, but for now, it's normal. The status quo is being established. The other women have relationship problems, and Samantha lives a blissful life of never remembering a man's name. Now it's time for our fourth woman to encounter her conflict, and so here enters the cringiest plot point in history. Her nanny has big wobbling boobs. <laughs> and get this. She's Irish. I hear it was quite the glorious wedding. Ah, oh, it was. This is a hate crime. Interestingly, the problem surrounding this is instigated not by Charlotte's own well-established neurotic sensibilities, but by her friends simply choosing to ruin her life. There ought to be a law against hiring a nanny that looks like that. Yeah. The Jude Law. <laughs> <laughs> Their comments infect her with a mind virus known colloquially as anxiety, and she is instantly seeing adulterous images in her mind. After Charlotte's friends laugh and joke, we look over at all of their men, and every single one of them is gazing directly at this woman's chest. It seems it wasn't only the children that were captivated by Charlotte's Irish nanny and her lucky charms. This plunges us into one of the true dark places of this movie because it presents these leering men barely containing their slobbering dog brains as if this is simply the natural way of things. They couldn't possibly do anything else and in fact, we will not even be discussing it. Ladies, get serious please, begin the castration ritual. Carrie, back at home, starts to get a little bit pissed off. Big wants to sit on the couch. Big wants to stay at home. Big wants to watch TV. Damn, that's sad. It's 4.30, where should I make reservations? Any cravings? Don't we have anything to eat here? Is this a bad time to say that I think Carrie has bad taste, by the way? This outfit is stinky. Let's just stay home. Okay. <sighs> Carrie and Big exchange anniversary gifts, and his gift is a TV. Carrie's very sad when she sees the TV. Me too, girl. That TV is too small. You guys are rich. Why don't you get a big TV? Don't you want to see every pixel of Romeo and Juliet clearly? You know, so you can really enjoy the craft? No? Okay. Back in the Miranda zone, Miranda's still on that phone. Sit down, please, and have some breakfast. I can't. Steve does not like his wife being on that phone, so he says, baby, please, please quit your job and spend time with me. Please, you can stay home with me. Life's too short. 
Go someplace where they appreciate you, and until you find a better job, you can be home and help out around the house. And Miranda's like, Steve, I am a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. I don't really know why he's suggesting that she stops having a job. It's sort of framed as this job in particular is bad. And Steve seems way into the idea of her just not having a job at all, instead of like maybe having a different job. He's just so quick to jump to this. Stay home with me, baby. But never mind, because her boss immediately has a sexism moment, so she quits. Is there a problem? I don't know. Is there? Did you have something you'd like to say to me in private? Oh, I don't know that it needs to be in private. And now she can chill with her son and man as long as she wants. Miranda's conflict is over as soon as it started. Where's Brady? Now, our first prize goes to Brady for his mouse maze. I love my son Brady. He's so talented. He made a mouse maze. Now she can have fun and vibe forever. Yay. Meanwhile, Charlotte experiences a sickening moment when she walks in on her husband spraying water on their nanny's chest. This is too much for me. I have to pause. I have to go get myself a special drink and take the hottest shower possible to blast the sticky sad feeling out of my body at this point. Don't let this stuff happen to Charlotte, please. She is my sweet little creature. I cannot allow this. I can't stand it. She calls Carrie for advice. Do I have anything to worry about? And it's genuinely hard to watch because it's like, yes girl, you should be worried. And I am telling you right now that Charlotte and her husband literally do not discuss this once in the movie. Not even once. This movie is about never communicating with men, just kind of existing around them like a fine mist. Charlotte weeps in the cupboard, overwhelmed by both the nanny situation and her two screaming little children, and then the nanny herself, Erin, saves her by swooping in to assume the workload. Yay. Thank you, booby woman. This moment of sort of nice. Erin is a good woman, big bouncing breasts or not, but Charlotte remains a kicked dog, never thinking of ripping her husband to shreds with her bare teeth. Not even once, Charlotte. Not even just to try it. Carrie talks to Samantha about her problem, which is, my husband likes watching TV. You know, the television and the ordering in, it's just getting a little too Mr. and Mrs. Married. And it's funny seeing this directly after Charlotte's moment of absolute weeping despair. Just watch some TV like the rest of us, Carrie. Just plop down in front of the TV and watch a classic Simpsons app. Just watch Dental Plan Lisa Needs Braces, okay? It's fine. It's okay. But maybe I'm being too cruel to Carrie because in the next scene, Big actually does behave like a weird, petulant baby boss. The two are supposed to attend a movie premiere, but Big's not in the mood because market values have dropped today. The market fell 100 points. And now I have to get dressed up and go to some Hollywood thing. Aw, little baby dropped his market values. He makes the mistake of being wildly passive aggressive about it, and so Carrie makes him go after all. Well, if you want to spend time with me, we'll stay here at our home, which you made so perfect. This is somewhat undermined by what she says in the next scene together. Is this because I'm a bitch wife who nags you? But I'm getting ahead of myself. In a way, Carrie is allowed by the movie to have the most interesting problem, being bored of her husband. Of only one year, by the way, girl, it is not looking good. And so it's not about the TV, it's about feeling that she's becoming dull and listless and tired and sick to death of this bloke. Nevertheless, this TV moment feels so incredibly stupid, especially when juxtaposed with what the other ladies are experiencing. Come on, girl, you sound and weird. The couple fight and Carrie decides to spend a day or two at her old apartment, which they just, they still have for some reason. They just, they just have two apartments. Samantha, of course, has no problems. She swerves some ageism. Is that maybe a little young? And wears a youthful dress to the red carpet where she bumps into Miley Cyrus, who is wearing the exact same thing. In this moment, we think, uh-oh, disaster. Uh-oh, embarrassing. But Miley is cool about it and everyone claps because female solidarity is real and true and the real friends with the Miley Cyrus as we never met along the way. Sometimes a girlfriend is a girl you've never even met. Great Samantha gets invited by some guy to visit the United Arab Emirates, because that's just how she lives. Have you ever been to the United Arab Emirates? No, and I could kick myself. And so our four women are dropped into the news that they are about to go on an exotic trip. Hold on tight, please. There will be turbulence. Before that sweet escape, though, Kara must wallow in one last sad scene with her sad husband. It's just going to be you and me, every night, for the rest of our lives. And I think that we are going to have to work on the sparkle. 
for the rest of our lives. I do not think this couple like each other very much. Okay, Carrie, real question now. Why do you hate comfort and chilling? Why do you make life so difficult for yourself? Why do you refuse to dull the pain and instead only enhance it? Why not lie on the goddamn couch, Carrie? <laughs> Big comes up with the idea of only cohabiting some of the time because he liked when Carrie went over to her old apartment, but Carrie finds this frightening. Marriage doesn't work like that. I thought we were supposed to be making up our own rules. <laughs> It's interesting to me that because Carrie's words and ideas frame everything we see in the Sex and the City universe, her inner world tends to be more heavily explored than the other ladies. While Miranda, Samantha, and Charlotte can be the uptight girl boss, the sex haver, and the prissy romantic, respectively. Are you saying you're just gonna give up on love? Oh, That's no. sick! Carrie can take on these and any other kind of traits to operate as a fully rounded freak. In this plotline, Carrie is bored and annoyed in a sort of aimless way that's quite annoying to watch, but that does speak to a real muddiness that can can come up in our relationships. Your weird, mean behaviours can come from some kind of confusing emotional space that might be extremely obvious in retrospect, but fully nonsense in the moment. I think that could be really interesting and cool, but the movie doesn't really do that much with it. Carrie's being extra, but the deeper issue is a bit of personal existentialism. Who am I beyond this glitzy character? Who am I as a wife, now in some way less a person and more a solid strange half to a man? What have I lost? Still, it disappoints me because there are plenty of interesting ways to explore how the individual identity might be constructed and warped and shattered and mangled through a big relationship with a man or through the looming passing of time and its effects on your status as a sexy cool icon. But the movie only offers a narrative saran wrap here, we're not really concerned with thinking about much beyond the idea that sometimes women be worrying. Anyway, damn, it sucks when my husband is not horny. The ladies are off to the UAE now, where Samantha is immediately punished by having her HRT confiscated. You gotta be kidding me. I am sorry, it is just a UAE law. But they're all natural. They're made from yams. <laughs> ladies, these are not drugs. You cannot take estrogen in Abu Dhabi, nasty girl. So finally begins the movie's problem for Samantha, experiencing the menopause. Let's go. Without those creams and vitamins, I will go ricocheting back into menopause. Miranda's main thing while on the trip is to become a brand new Abu Dhabi expert. Hey, what's the hold up? We got a lot of Abu Dhabi to do. Abu Dhabi do. She is the vector through which we will experience information about the local culture. Dates are the traditional welcome fruit of the Middle East. I read that in one of these. I am ready for your wisdom, Miranda. Read Wikipedia pages about Abu Dhabi to me now. Men and women do not embrace in public in the Middle East. She could do anything now that she's jobless. A few interesting moments happen in our introduction to the concept of being in the Middle East. One, Omar Jalili says that the rugby team have many, many balls. Do they also bring their balls? Yes, they have many, many balls. Two, the women worry that Samantha will be arrested for being horny. Hopefully this doesn't happen. Three, Charlotte uses her maiden name, York, as opposed to her married named Goldenblatt because she's worried about anti-semitism. Um, York? What happened to uh, Goldenblatt? It's the Middle East. It's the new Middle East. It's the Middle East. We don't come back to this, but it is a funny line to just include. And four, the women see and discuss a fully covered woman. There she is. The robes are called abayas, and the veil that covers everything except the eyes is a necrom. Certainly cuts back on the Botox bill. <laughs> so this place is exotic, strange, and restrictive to them. They are at once excited to be here and loosely concerned about how they might get arrested or hate crimed. Women are different here. They wear these things. Women are required to dress in a way that does not attract sexual attention. It's fascinating and perhaps a bit scary, but we pay it no mind right now except for some jokes. A lift for every fry. Do not buy illegal fake watches, by the way. Men may approach you with black market watches. If you engage them, they will move you into a room and try to sell you other items. It is illegal. Other than that, you'll not have to worry. People here are very honest. Which character will later fall victim to this dark trap? Place your bets now. Speaking of jokes, Carrie bumps into her sexy ex Aiden at the market. And there in the middle of old Abu Dhabi was an old love, Aiden. Uh-oh. 
This is the best mirage that I've ever had. Damn. Me when I see the woman who cheated on me to get with her greasy husband, I guess. Just a blissful experience. They embrace and Carrie absolutely has to indulge in a very funny joke. Is this allowed here? Very good, Carrie. <laughs> Aiden says he has a meeting with some Abu Dhabi business blokes. They don't cotton to the ladies at the <laughs> lunches. And Carrie's like... I knew I should have packed my burka. Damn, she's really doing our type 5 right now and no one can keep her down. So Aiden invites Carrie to go for dinner and we return to the other women, ogling men at the pool for a moment, a brief glimpse of joy, although this alarms Samantha because she is, for once, not extremely aroused. I have a whole pool of testosterone from down under and I'm not feeling anything down under. Since they're at the pool, they must now discuss the burkini. Legs? Miranda, I'm at the pool. What am I supposed to wear? How about a burkini? <laughs> Yeah, they have them at the gift shop. What if we wore that? Damn, <laughs> that would be crazy. And then we're treated to an Arabian Nights ass version of the Sex and the City theme tune. <laughs> the ladies are getting on camels now. Camel, 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 camel. This, on camels, is where women are meant to be. Unfortunately, Charlotte is desperately trying to get cell service to talk to her husband and make sure he's not spraying women again or worse. Can you hear me now? Harry! Miranda! So she cannot truly enjoy the camels. And this is the powerful women's moral coming into play here. If you make your life too much about your husband, you will not be able to enjoy your camel. And that ain't right. The next thing they know after they're done with their camels is that Carrie's book all about marriage has been slammed in the New Yorker. Until the talented Bradshaw is better able to grasp the complexities of married life, she would be better advised to explore the vow of silence. Miranda takes this opportunity to vocalize a sort of thematic link that the movie is interested in. Men in the US pretend they're comfortable with strong women, but really a lot of them would prefer us eating french fries behind our veils. Word. Klong. There we have it, fellas. The movie's thesis about women. Anyway, forget that. Carrie is going to cheat on her husband now, and Charlotte knows it. Why are you having dinner with him? Honestly, Charlotte was always my favorite woman as a kid, precisely because she's the only one who would say, Carrie, you shouldn't cheat on your husband, Carrie. It's wrong to do that, Carrie. I think you're playing with fire. Charlotte has some semblance of morals, and perhaps that's why she must be punished by Carrie's cruel retort here. Oh my god, now I'm playing with fire? All right, you've gone crazy. Seriously, you're, you're crazy in Abu Dhabi. Just because you're worried about your marriage, everyone's gonna cheat. So this is too much. She breaks down for a while. She's done. And this scene makes me so sad. She's just genuinely devastated by this exchange. Aw, Charlotte. It's okay, baby. You okay? Yeah, I'm just really, really tired. I'm gonna take a nap. Fortunately, we get a really sweet moment from Miranda here, who takes Charlotte out for a little drink and compels her to just let it all out. She talks about how guilty she feels because her biggest concern in all of this was losing her nanny. When I heard Samantha say that Harry was gonna cheat on me with Aaron, yeah. my first thought was, I can't lose the nanny! This is probably the realest moment in the film, just two women pulling the pain out of their chests. I just feel like I'm failing all the time. You're not failing. Being a mother is hard. Oh my god, it is so hard! Miranda confesses, as her emotional tribute, that she misses her job. Being a mother is not enough. I miss my job. Of course you do, Miranda. Go get one. Charlotte does a really cute laugh at the end of this convo, and I hope one day she finds the strength to kill her stinky husband. <laughs> Carrie and Aiden are having their ill-advised dinner together, and Aiden starts talking about how his wife is so jealous and cautious of Carrie. You know, she always kind of kept one eye on you, the one that got away. Um, that's epic, bro. Anyway, they make out, and Carrie immediately starts freaking out because, you know, it's bad to cheat, and so on. She consults the ladies immediately, and they all debate whether she should tell Big, with the reactions ranging from, cheating is fine if it's just a kiss. A kiss is nothing. To, I don't know if you should tell him, because when I found out my husband cheated, it was extremely painful. Now that I know it was only that one time, yeah. was the pain worth it? I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. To, um, I don't know, I'm drunk. I don't know. I'm a little drunk. 
ladies, please be serious. But Carrie, despite this advice, calls up her husband and says, um, I'm sorry, sorry I cheated on you with my ex-boyfriend. Mm, so sorry, baby. It didn't mean anything. And it lasted only a second. Girl, you lie. That's literally Aiden. That's big Aiden. That's that's literally Aiden. That's literally Aiden. Big hangs up. It's time for the call charter. That's it. That's that's it. Now that everything is crumbling for our women, except Miranda, who just wants to get a job again, what could possibly be happening to Samantha? She gets arrested. For what, you may ask? K uh, kissing. I've been arrested. We, we, a little kiss. We did not have sex. We were just kissing. Oh, Samantha, you naughty woman. Because of this, they are effectively kicked out of their hotel and have to rush to the airport to go back home. However, idiot Carrie realizes she's lost her passport. She does know exactly where she left it though, so they all head to the market, grab that passport nice and easy, and fuck off. Except that somebody gets lured into a fake watch selling zone. Did you guess who it was? It was Charlotte. She needs a gift for her undeserving big bald man, and so the women head into the counterfeit room where Samantha, due to intense hot flashes brought on by her lack of HRT pills, gets so hot and bothered that she takes the wrong bag. The men for some reason immediately assume this was intentional and they chase after her, ripping her bag from her hands and causing a million condoms to fall out into the street. Men surround her, booing and jeering, and she starts screaming at them. Condoms! Condoms! Yes! men are scandalized and a Benny Hill chase sequence follows, but the women run into a room of burka wearing women, a liminal space where men cease to exist. These women must feel a powerful kinship with the New York Four as they immediately reveal their faces and disrobe to show that underneath their burkas they are wearing big fashion outfits. Louis Vuitton. Yes. Yes. The whole group bonds over this fashion moment and also the landmarks of New York. <laughs> and it turns out that the women also love Samantha's antics. That was quite a show outside. Terrible. So disrespectful. Yes. I quite enjoyed it. It's funny that for the New Yorkers to bond with the Abu Dhabians, we must see that they are in fact just like us. It seems to counteract Miranda's earlier expression of solidarity and connection among women under different circumstances and cultures to have them actually literally turn out to be the same. Reading the same books, wearing the same clothes, it might be trying to express a fundamental connection between all women no matter their circumstances, but it falls flat somewhat by transforming these women into simple imitations of Americans. They're like cartoons. It's weird. I was gonna show you a clip from the documentary Four Sisters, which I saw at TIFF last year. Really, really good and touching and weird film, but it doesn't have any kind of digital or physical release yet, so I'll just describe the scene instead. I know that's slower, but I don't have a choice. There's no way to show you the clip. Boo. So the two sisters who still live in Tunisia because they didn't choose to join Islamic State talk about their experience with modest dress, and they describe it in terms of relative and changing beliefs about both liking wearing burqas and finding them restrictive. One thing that interests me is that from both perspectives there was an understanding of rebellion because attitudes toward modest wear were somewhat politically volatile when these girls were growing up. So wearing the veil and being more pious could feel more rebellious when the government pointed away from that and then vice versa. We also see the interplay between the sisters as they describe how they loved making fun of each other for their different approaches to wearing these clothes and that's pretty funny. It's complex and interesting and vast and we see both the fun they had in flirting with the edge of the expectations placed on them and the fear they had about being deviant about being seen as disgusting, distasteful, hypersexual women. It's a moment where I felt really connected to them, and it's a lot more than we love wearing ugly tops under our robes. Obviously no one expects good, thoughtful introspection into the strange relationship between rich white Americans and Muslim women from Abu Dhabi, from Sex in the City 2, but all the same it's a striking depiction. It constructs these women as a strange version of our normative gang, and it's kind of fascinating. Why do they love Suzanne Summers so much? Like, what's up? But the Abu Dhabi women of Sex and City 2 serve another purpose. How will our ladies get past the mob of angry men who are apparently still lurking and seething outside? Well, baby, it's time for the most incredible idea ever dreamt of, an idea that has never before occurred to a white person. Can you guess what it is? That's right, it's time for a burka escape. All clear. Inspired. So the women see that the other women are like them, and then they become them, for the japes of it all. But this daring burka escape is not quite as inspired as Carrie's next move. I have an idea. Hold this. What's she doing? I don't know.
this woman's ideas are too met. She cannot be stopped. Her leg is out and her brain is unfathomably large. So thanks to Big Brain Carrie, they make it onto the plane. Carrie drops another astonishing one-liner. Do you have anything to declare? Yes, I'm a mess. And everyone goes home. Carrie gets home to an unthinkable husbandless void. Nothing worse than that. No big, no TV. Make Carrie something something. Big does show up though to Carrie's great relief and finally we get to hear his response to Carrie's philandering ways. What does he do? He gives her a big ring. <laughs> Damn girl cheat more, I guess. Get get those adultery jewels. Big is the only one of the husband characters who has any reaction to a single event of the film, and that reaction is to respond to Carrie's weird cringe behaviour by laying on the charm and promising to prioritise keeping that sparkle in their marriage. On one hand, this is dull and unsatisfying, I want punishment and I want drama, but on the other hand, Big has done enough nasty business in this relationship over the course of Sex and the City and its first movie that, you know, it's sort of nice. But I think the only conclusion I can come to is that I want this couple sealed in a perspex box and sent down to the Mariana Trench. Just throw them down there. I can't, I can't, can't do this anymore. We see that Miranda learned that she should um, have a good job and not a bad job. Miranda learned that at the right law firm, where her voice was valued, don't she was also stop. fun at work. I think she actually, you know, I think she knew that from the beginning, but Okay, Samantha has sex in the in the beautiful land of the free, and the most egregious of the movie's conclusions comes last. Charlotte doesn't have to worry about her husband's fully actualized perv behavior because guess what? The nanny is gay. And Charlotte learned that she never really had anything to worry about. Turns out, her hot nanny preferred the company of other hot nannies. We're not gonna unpack that one. Don't worry about that. And here's Carrie's pithy conclusion at last. Here's what we learned about relationships from the women of Abu Dhabi. Carrie has learned that her marriage is like a veil. As for me, I began to think of marriage much like the real housewife of Abu Dhabi's veil. You have to take the tradition and decorate it your way. Damn girl. <laughs> Maybe the New Yorker was right to roast ya. Cause that is the most cringe thing I've ever heard. Um, that's Sex in the City too. There is a lot going on. I like the camels, I hate everything else. They should have just cut it off at Liza. They should have cut it off there. We all would have been happy. Ah!